Thank you for coming this morning uh, to the uh, library's Future of the Research Library Speaker Series. My name is Daniel Mack. I'm the Associate Dean for Collection Strategies and Services here at the University Libraries. And I am very happy today to introduce uh, our guest, uh, Nicole Allen. Nicole Allen is Director of Op Open Education for SPARC, one of the uh, main organizations for promoting open access. Uh, in this role, Nicole leads SPARC's work on the issue of uh, open education with a dual focus on public policy and on engaging the library community to advance this issue on campus. Nicole is an internationally recognized expert and leading voice in the movement for open education. Uh, starting during her own days as a student, she has worked tirelessly to elevate the issue of college textbook costs and access to education into the public spotlight and to advance openness as a solution in both policy and practice. Drawing on her unique perspective as both a millennial, the same generation as most of today's college students, and a professional with more than a decade of experience in this field, Nicole has been uh, widely cited in the media and has given hundreds of talks and training sessions in more than a dozen countries on open access, uh, open education, policy, and grassroots advocacy. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Nicole Allen. Thank you for that very kind introduction. It's great to be here. Actually, the last time I was here on campus at the University of Maryland, uh, I was at the very beginning of a 40-campus cross-country van tour with two giant textbook mascot costumes uh, called the Textbook Rebellion. I should have put a picture up here. Uh, maybe we can do that during Q&A. Um, but uh, that was about five years ago. I'm five years older. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just wonderful to be back here, so thank you for the invitation, and um, I'm excited to talk about the future of libraries, uh, OER, and, and, and textbook costs. So before I begin, just to get a sense of who's here, um, how many here are from the library? Uh, so most of you, all of you, potentially. <laughs> um, anybody not from the library? <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so uh, just so you know, SPARC is a library membership organization of 200 academic and research libraries across North America in a worldwide network, uh, including over 800 academic and research libraries. And the University of Maryland is one of our members. Uh, and we work on a broad range of issues relating to advancing openness in research and education. Uh, we're based uh, down in Washington, D.C. And uh, my role is, is focusing on that education component of that. So uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that uh, the slides that you'll see today uh, are posted online. Um, I take the everything but the kitchen sink uh, approach to slides. So we're going to run through a lot of different slides with a lot of different statistics and links. Uh, you can download these slides uh, here. Uh, on SlideShare if you'd like to follow up on anything that I mention. Uh, these slides and my transcript are also licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license, so you're free to use and adapt these as you see fit. Um, oh, and that's me on Twitter. Uh, so, happy Open Access Week, everybody. Uh, so, this is Open Access Week. I'm not wearing my orange, uh, but <laughs> I see a couple of buttons, which is awesome. Uh, so Open Access Week is an annual uh, event to promote awareness uh, and inspire action on uh, opening up the way that we share research in, in the scholarly environment. And uh, all around the world people are, are, are holding events for Open Access Week and uh, it's great to be here uh, for that. So uh, I, I think probably most of you are familiar with open access. When we say that, we mean the free, immediate, online availability of, of scholarly research articles and other research publications uh, with the right to fully reuse them in the digital environment. And today we're going to be talking about another type of content, academic content, which is uh, textbooks and other educational materials, which is in a parallel space and a space that libraries haven't been as directly engaged with as they have obviously with research publications. So we're gonna start out at the beginning looking at textbook costs and 
the problem that we're facing right now. A lot of these you know, graphs and statistics are going to look somewhat familiar to you as, as parallels to the scholarly journal space. Uh, then talk a little bit about what openness means in the educational, in the educational resources. Take a quick tour of what's happening uh, around the country and world on, on open education and then talk about some of the things that you can do here and perhaps are already doing to advance open education in, in the library. So this graph represents uh, textbook prices and uh, the prices of other uh, uh, education related expenses. Uh, for the last decade. So the top line, the orange line, is textbook prices. Just under it is tuition. Just under that is housing. So as you can see, textbook prices are rising out of control. That's 88% uh, over the last decade. And uh, you know, obviously when we look at the overall cost of college, students are facing a lot of different expenses. Tuition is a large one, housing is another. Uh, there's, uh, you know, transportation to and from campus, other expenses like childcare and tutoring um, and, and things like this. But books and supplies is a kind of unique and significant part of what students are facing uh, with, with college costs. Not because it's the single largest expense that they face, but because it's one of the last that they face. And uh, if you look at where this fits in to an overall student budget at the top. It's a two-year institution at the bottom. It's a public four-year institution. Textbook prices are, uh, uh, when you combine it with other books and supplies, uh, between $1,200 and, and $1,300 a year. So again, not the largest expense, but it's a significant one. And it's often paid out of pocket by students. So you know, you've, you've gotten together enough uh, funding through loans and grants and help from parents, uh, money saved over the summer to pay for tuition and housing. Uh, but then comes textbooks, and that's another perhaps $1,000 on top of that. So I, I like to think about this expense as uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's, um, uh, comes after other expenses and the just psychological impact of it can be really significant. So I was really excited to see that there's uh, awareness of this issue here on campus. Uh, I found this website, uh, the oer.umd.edu, where they talk about a number of textbook affordability issues happening here, which is awesome. There's some fa faculty success stories, some student pictures of, of students talking about the impact of textbook costs. Uh, so I know that this is an issue that many of you are aware of and, and that is uh, being addressed on campus, but um, I think just looking at this uh, uh, as a, a national problem uh, is, is important too. So just to give you one illustration of textbook costs. So this is an economics textbook, the kind of canonical uh, economics intro textbook by uh, Gregory Mankiw. Uh, so can you see what the hardcover costs? $399, almost $400 for an intro economics textbook. I mean, th think about that. That's crazy. And especially the irony <laughs> of economics <laughs> because if you could afford to buy this textbook, it would tell you all about why these prices are so outrageously out of control. Uh, so this is just one illustration of the problems that, that, that students face of affording their textbooks. So $400, essentially, to buy a hardcover copy of this book. You can get a ebook if you want. Uh, so you see here, here's some ebook options. You can get it for one semester for $96. So, you know, that's a quarter of the price. That's not bad, right? Except economics is often taught as a two semester course. And if you're majoring in economics, your intro book is going to be essential for your entire education. So you're actually not saving that much money if you only buy access for one semester. Uh, there are options to keep it longer, but notice that there aren't options to buy it digitally. So it's true that technology is being used to give students more options for buying their books, 
And it, in this case, if you can call this less expensive, less expensive options. But they're not leveraging what the digital environment truly was meant to do, which is to rapidly share information efficiently and allow people to store information for longer periods of time. And you know, when you think about the kind of message, like if, if we shift to this model, the ebook model, where you know it's a, a, a $100 ebook that you can't keep instead of a $400 hardcover book, uh, the message that that sends students isn't good either. So it's kind of like um, telling students, you better read it really fast because it's <laughs> going to disappear. And that isn't the message we should be sending students in the digital age, right? You know, today's students have grown up with the internet. They are used to getting access to information instantly, a vast wealth of information instantly at no cost over the internet. The first instinct is Google it. And you can find just about anything on the internet. But yet the digital materials we're telling them to use in classes are, are, are this. They're, they're the men in black style uh, textbooks, which is just not only counterintuitive, but it doesn't support the kind of education that, that, that we can do in the digital age. So taking a step back, let's talk about why this is happening. So it's, you know, it's a, a lot of, uh, I, I guess, counterintuitive and strange things are happening in, in the textbook marketplace, but why? Um, and again, if you could afford that $400 economics textbook, you could find a lot of this information in there. Uh, so first of all, the textbook market is a captive market. Students are uh, uh, required to buy whatever materials they've been assigned. And those decisions are made by faculty. And that's right, because you know, obviously professors are the experts and they know what materials are best for their courses. But what that means is that once a professor chooses a book, the student is essentially trapped into buying whatever it is. And that gives the publisher a disproportionate amount of power to be able to charge essentially whatever they want. And even though professors care about this issue, you know, they're aware that textbooks are expensive and that it's impacting students, they're not always aware of how expensive textbooks are. Uh, even despite federal law that was uh, uh, enacted uh, over five years ago to help uh, make sure that professors could get access to this information, awareness still isn't uh, as high as it, as it should be. So uh, as a result, textbook prices are inelastic. They keep rising. And that's why the publishing industry hasn't faced a lot of the transformation that other intellectual property-based industries like the music industry and the film industry have faced as digital technology has become more prevalent. So there's also a, a near monopoly in the market. So it's not a true monopoly, but there are five major companies that control the vast majority of the market and uh, in, in, in higher ed publishing. So, and they all engage in the same kind of practices. So it's all these really expensive books, uh, you know, shifting to an ebook model where you rent rather than buy the book. There's you know no, no buying books anymore, and uh, offering uh, uh, supplements that go with textbooks that limit uh, the ability of students to get lower cost options like used books or, or using books at the library because they come with, for example, an access code that expires at the end of the semester, so even if you can get access to the book, you can't get access to the access code, and if you need that to turn in your homework, you're going to fail the course. So uh, finally, the last economic point I want to make is that there are actually some signs of a market failure. So if you read articles about this issue, you'll start to see things like textbook spending is going down, students are spending less on textbooks, and that is likely true, but that doesn't mean that things are getting better. So think about it for a moment. So sure, their students can rent books. Now more, like when I started college in 2003, renting wasn't an option. It's, it's widely available now. Uh, used books are, are widely available over the web. Um, so that's part of this. But the more sinister uh, uh, under currents of what's happening is, is there are all sorts of studies that have come out recently showing that students simply aren't buying the books that they've been assigned. Uh, they've been a number of studies recently that find, find that about two-thirds of students report that they haven't bought some of their books because the price is too high, so opting out of the market. 
So of course textbook spending is going down if students aren't buying their books. But again, that doesn't mean the problem is getting better. Um, and in uh, this particular study that's cited here in the notes, 78% uh, of the students who said that they'd done this said that they did it even knowing that it could likely hurt their academic performance in the class. So after getting through all of the work they did to pay for tuition and pay for housing and pay for all of their other college expenses, this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, one in two students in another study say that they've at some point taken fewer courses due to the cost of textbooks. So think about that. That means that students are delaying their academic uh, career because of the cost of textbooks. It's taking longer to get to graduation, longer to get out of college, get a job and start paying back some of that debt. Um, the stu average student debt, there just some new numbers came out just last week showing that the average student debt nationwide is over $30,000 at graduation for the class of 2015. Uh, so if you take longer to get out of college, that interest is just going to accumulate and make it harder to pay back. And then another statistic, and I use this one a lot with faculty uh, who um, sometimes push back against the idea of using open educational resources or alternatives because you know they have their book and like their book and, and you know that's great but statistics show that less than half of students in any given class actually have the current edition of the book that they've been assigned. So less than half of the students in your class have the book you told them to buy. Some have older editions, some have e-editions, uh, or rather uh, 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 unauthorized e-editions that they have uh, gotten off of the internet, sharing copies with friends, photocopying portions of the text, um, uh, getting unbundled editions or international editions that are essentially the same text but produced for India or, or other uh, markets. Uh, so, you know, it's gotten to the point where students just don't have the materials that they've been assigned and at the end of the day, you know, students can't learn from materials that they can't afford them. So affordability is becoming a barrier to student success. And it's this, this problem that has led us to open educational resources because in today's world, we can do better. We know we can do better. Uh, we have you know, the, the technology to share information rapidly and efficiently, unlike ever before. We have the ability to print hard copies of textbooks for five to ten dollars a piece. Uh, it, you know, these books shouldn't be this expensive and it shouldn't be this hard to get students the academic materials they need to succeed. So that's how we come to this idea of open educational resources. So how many of you are familiar with this term? Awesome. Anybody want to define it? Just kidding. <laughs> I'll do that. But, uh, so OER, as I will say for the rest of this talk, uh, so this is a term of art. Uh, it, taking a step back, uh, the idea of open education is, is a broader term that's used more fluidly and refers to uh, any type of educational practice or tool where barriers are being removed, typically through the use of technology. So this may be open enrollment, this may be uh, online courses that are, that are broadcast to the world, uh, it may be open educational practices where you're engaging students in co-creation or having students publish their essays online. So, uh, you know, many different ways for open education to be practiced. And I think uh, uh, in many ways, this is th these are the future frontiers of open education. Uh, but when we're talking about open educational resources, we're talking about the actual books and content, whether it's, you know, video or... Uh, lecture notes or PowerPoint slides or any kind of educational tool or instrument uh, that is open. So when we say open, we mean something very specific. And those of you familiar with open access will recognize this. So open means free, meaning free of cost and free of barriers, uh, plus the right to reuse the content. And in the open education space, we talk about what are called the five R's of reuse. <laughs> uh, so the first is to be able to retain the content, meaning keep and control a copy forever, save a, you know, an entire library of resources on a flash drive. Um, or uh, you know, just make sure that you're not going to have that men in black moment with the content you've been using in a course. 
the second is reuse, meaning to use a resource in any context you want, whether it's intended for that context or not. Uh, one of the coolest examples of this is a lot of the open data that's been published uh, by the government is uh, you know, great to use as an educational tool for students. So that content can be reused, even though it wasn't intend originally intended for education, it can be used as an educational resource. Uh, revise and remix, meaning to be able to uh, ch actually take a resource and create your own version of it. So not changing the original, obviously, but um, for example, uh, editing a text resource to contain local examples. Uh, this is really important in subjects like math, where uh, visualization and local context actually make a really big difference for students' ability to um, uh, visualize and conceptualize problems. For example, if you're doing a, pro a problem on um, parabolic curves and you're talking about a bridge, um, wouldn't it be better if you're talking about a bridge, um, for example, students in New York might use the George Washington Bridge and students in San Francisco might use the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and being able to visualize that in your surroundings is important. Uh, remix, meaning to take several resources and mix them together. So take uh, you know, two different open textbooks and, and exchange chapters or embed video in a text-based resource. And then finally, redistribute, meaning to uh, uh, share a copy of whatever you've created uh, with anyone, anywhere, anytime. Okay, so the official definition of OER is by the Hewlett Foundation. Um, it's a more complicated way of saying all of that. Uh, teaching and learning, teaching, learning, and research resources that either reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use or repurposing by others. Yes, I have that memorized. Uh, so when we talk about intellectual property licenses, that's what we usually use to release the reuse rights, the five R's. Um, if a resource is in the public domain, obviously that's not necessary because it, it's not covered by copyright, but Creative Commons licensing is the tool we usually use. Um, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with Creative Commons licensing. Uh, it's you know, a, a system of licenses that use copyright to enable free and open use, essentially, <laughs> flipping the default from all rights reserved to some rights reserved. And uh, there are a range of different licenses in the system. Generally, we consider anything that permits uh, the five R's as open. So that goes all the way down to the non-commercial share-alike license. Um, so with o this is where OER and open access differ a little bit. With open access, we only consider resources that are either in the public domain or licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license that permits full reuse rights as open access. Whereas OER, it's a little bit more flexible uh, because for educational purposes, it, it's effectively um, you can still do a lot of the same things. So, quick tour of the OER space. Um, so, there's a great uh, resource called the OER World Map, where you can see stories of people all over the world that are doing things in open education. I encourage you to check that out for just kind of a flavor of what's happening uh, all over the world. Um, we're gonna focus here on what's happening in North America. So I think one of, the, one of the projects that most people are aware of and, and became aware of very early on is MIT's Open Courseware program, uh, which was essentially popularized the idea of open educational resources where MIT said, you know, hey, professors who want ha create valuable resources that you want to share, we'll help you share them. And they've uh, so far shared resources from over 2,000 MIT courses that have been used by over 200 million people across the world. And, you know, it's not, you know, these are by people that, you know, would never get access to the kind of quality education that MIT provides. And one of the things that I find really interesting about this, this program is that they found that, that a, a, a measurable number of people who apply to come to MIT do so because they found out about it through MIT OpenCourseWare. Uh, so, you know, hugely beneficial to the institution. And the other really cool thing is that those 200 million people that have used these resources, there's another over 50 million people that have used translations of these resources. They've been translated into over six languages uh, by affiliate institutions around the world. You know, the kind of thing that it isn't possible with closed resources. But because of the open license, they can be translated and used uh, in, in universities in, in, in their native tongue. 
So that's MIT, uh, and there are actually over 200 institutions that have similar programs <coughs> like that around the world. There's also online repositories of resources. This is one example, oercommons.org. Uh, as you can see, there are hundreds of thousands of resources there that uh, are across a wide variety of subject levels uh, and, and, and grades. And uh, this is really interesting in the K-12 context. Uh, these, a lot of these resources are categorized by standard. So uh, when K-12 teachers go here, they can select the actual educational standard that they're looking to teach and find resources there. So something that could translate to higher ed. Uh, there are also OER publishing efforts. I think the, the most exciting one, uh, I, I think, is OpenStax. It's based at Rice University, and it's essentially a, a, a publishing effort, or a publishing company, uh, where they're working to publish open textbooks in the top 25 highest enrollment subjects. So, you know, we're talking intro calculus, um, intro bio, intro statistics, the subjects where textbook costs are the highest. Um, and I actually have an example of one of their books, which I'm happy to pass around. So this is, uh, this, this is a, uh, one of the OpenStax textbooks in sociology. This book costs, I think, about $30 to get it in this hardbound, full-color version. Um, and then, of course, it's free online to read, download, uh, and for professors to adapt. So I'll pass this around if you want to take a look. Uh, they also, interestingly, have a textbook in economics. Uh, so this is compared to that $400 textbook we saw earlier. Uh, this is available to view for free online, uh, download as a PDF, put on an e-reader. You can get an enhanced iBook version for a little bit of money, I think $5 or something like that. Uh, you can get accessible versions through Bookshare. Uh, and you can also get, uh, you know, one of these one of these print copies. Uh, let's see, it's uh, thirty-eight fifty to get a print copy of this economics textbook. So pretty big difference, right? Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is that there was just a study done uh, by the Babson Survey Research Group that found that OpenStax textbooks are used in the subjects where OpenStax has books they're used by 10% of the professors teaching courses in those subjects. So they've only been publishing books for a few years. And that level of market penetration is really remarkable. And it really speaks to not only the quality of these textbooks, but also the demand in the marketplace uh, for low cost alternatives uh, to expensive textbooks. So this, these textbooks are also available in uh, OpenStax's online OER repository, which includes a lot of other OER content as well that can be mixed and matched. This is just an example of one of the chapters. You can see you know, different terms are linked, and you can see the table of contents over there. Um, notice that I picked the chapter on price elasticity, <laughs> elasticity um, which is highly relevant to this conversation. Um, as you can see, they're, they're hardbound printed books uh, as well. So there are also other open textbook publishers. So there's a, a project in the UK called Open Book Publishers, which uh, originally focused on scholarly manuscripts, but is starting to get into open textbooks as well. Uh, you can see the little open access logo at the top. Uh, so all of you know that uh, uh, scholarly research articles that are published under an, an open license uh, as open access can be great educational tools as well, uh, plus, uh, articles, of course, are all under a Creative Commons attribution license, and uh, you know all of the images and graphs and uh, data sets that come with these articles are also open and can be valuable educational tools. And, and I know that a, a number of OER authors have actually taken images published in PLOS, PLOS journal articles uh, to illustrate textbooks um, and, and different case studies uh, that are that are published in PLOS. Um, there uh, are also efforts to actually create full open courses. Uh, so the example I have here is Carnegie Mellon University's Open Learning Initiative, where they have you know full complete courses that are uh, all open educational resources. You can go online and sign up, and it has all of the course content there. 
and it's actually built with adaptive technology where um, the, uh, it, it asks questions as the student goes along and can actually assess their progress in learning the material and, and, and bring up core concepts later uh, or uh, actually rearrange the content to better suit the, the needs of the learners. And, and this generates a huge amount of really useful data that can actually help them improve the content over time. So again, that's one difference between open resources and traditional resources is that when you recognize a problem in the resource you're using, with traditional resources, you have, you're powerless to change it. The only thing you can do is supplement it. Whereas with open resources, you can actually, you have the legal right to change it. So there are also things uh, <coughs> happening in the policy space. So some of you may have heard, I know there are a couple of grants here in Maryland, of the Department of Labor's uh, TACT program, which is possibly one of the most ridiculous acronyms that has ever been invented. It stands for the Trade Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grants Program. And it was a two, $2 billion investment in improving workforce training programs for trade affected workers and gave grants all across the country. And rather than funding, uh, you know, community colleges in 10 different locations to develop curriculum on the same thing. They funded uh, you know, a set of grants and required all of the uh, institutions that participated to openly license the materials that they created so that other institutions around the country and world could use them. And actually one of my favorite examples of this program is they, they funded a uh, green energy curriculum in Arizona, I believe it was, and um, later on, the U.S. Department of State USAID program uh, in Mexico needed a curriculum on green energy to help train uh, people in, in Mexico as part of one of their programs. And rather than buying, using our money as taxpayers to buy a new program or develop a new one on their own, they just took the one that was developed through TACT and translated it into Spanish and made some adjustments to the Mexican context and then shared it right back with the original institution, which has a large population of Spanish speakers at it. So it actually ended up enhancing education in both places and saving us as taxpayers money. So, uh, you know, just as a public policy uh, uh, practice, open licensing makes a lot of sense. And as we speak, there's uh, actually a department-wide policy at the U.S. Department of Education under review by the White House that would uh, make this the rule for all Department of Education grants, that any educational resources developed through their uh, discretionary grants would be openly licensed and shared uh, with the public. So I want to give a couple of examples of how OER is having an impact at institutions and then talk a little bit more about what specifically you can do here. Uh, so first of all, I, I think it's important to recognize just the kind of impact that using open educational resources can have on students. So this is a professor in Washington State uh, who started using open textbooks in his own classes and just through the students that he taught, he saved over a million dollars for students over, over a set of years. I mean, th think about that, just the students he was teaching. Uh, so, you know, when you look at the, probably your intro bio, intro chem, intro calc lecture sections here, what, four or five hundred people, maybe, um, you know, times two hundred or four hundred, that's a lot of money uh, that, that switching to OER can have, and, you know, you don't need to switch in every course, but if, if you can start where it has the largest impact on students, it can, um, you know, add up a lot. Uh, another example is for authors. So uh, these are two authors of an open textbook in statistics. So uh, they originally published the first edition of this book through a traditional publisher, and they sold about a thousand copies of the book a year. So they're helping about a thousand, you know, people learn their subject and you know go out of kind of you know a royalty check that wasn't huge, but they got one. They published a second edition as an open textbook. And since then, literally millions of people have used this book. And uh, so not only are they impacting the education of a lot of people, but uh, they received an award from the Texas Academic Authors Association 
which was a huge uh, professional uh, uh, achievement that helped advance their careers. So it's not just, uh, the, the benefits of publishing open, openly aren't just about uh, making uh, money versus not making money. There, there are many different ways that, that publishing openly can have an impact for authors too. There are also impacts on, on student learning. Uh, so there have been a number of studies published recently that found that, that students who use open textbooks in place of traditional resources actually do better. So they get higher, higher grades uh, or, or the same grades as their peers. Um, they tend, in, in most cases, to take a, a larger credit load the next semester, which is really interesting. Um, so it just uh, you know, reiterates that, that statistic I shared earlier that students are taking fewer courses because of textbook costs. Um, and more of the same number of students are completing the courses. So uh, it's definitely correlated with, um, so this puts to bed any questions about quality. Uh, you know, can free resources be high quality? I mean, it comes down to our students succeeding and what these show, studies show. Yeah, they are. Uh, there are also efforts to uh, actually expand the impact of OER throughout entire degree programs. Uh, so this idea started at Tidewater Community College and, and has expanded to uh, a, a consortium of 38 community colleges around the country uh, that are developing open educational resources throughout entire degree programs, which has been shown ex uh, kind of concentrating that impact within a specific degree um, has uh, a, 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 a commensurate impact. And then the University of Maryland University College here has actually uh, decided to replace all of its undergraduate textbooks with open educational resources and other free content. So uh, that's taking it to another level of scale. Um, so I want to wrap up with uh, kind of what some, some tips that you can take away as, as you go back to your work here at the University of Maryland. Uh, starting small and, and maybe going big. So I, I think the first thing to think about is just how can you make sharing easy? Just going back to this idea of MIT's open courseware program. They just set up a, a system where professors could share the resources that they wanted to share. And I, because education is about sharing, good educators want to share their knowledge. And finding ways to make that easy can have um, a, a, a really big impact. You know, can you archive materials in your institutional repository? Can you encourage professors to use Creative Commons licensing? Like, I'm sure you have a copyright librarian here at the University of Maryland. Perhaps he or she is even in the room. No. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, re well, regardless, uh, just making professors aware of Creative Commons licensing and, and using Creative Commons licensing on any works created here in the library can have an impact. The second thing is just to think about OER before traditional materials. So anywhere a traditional resources is used, how can you replace it with uh, an open resource? So I noticed that you have a libguide here, which is fantastic. That's a, a really great first step, uh, encouraging faculty to check this out. Subject area librarians, you know, as you work with faculty members, are there ways that you can work OER into the conversation? Ask them what materials they're using. Uh, maybe recommend resources in their subjects. So if somebody's you know, teaching intro economics, um, encourage them to check out the OpenStax textbook, especially if they're using that $400 ManQ book. Uh, another great resource just to point out is the Open Textbook Library. This is uh, supported by the Open Textbook Network, and uh, they've archived, I believe, over 200 open textbooks published from a wide variety of sources, uh, where it's actually searchable by subject. And there are, there are faculty reviews of most of the books. So on a five-star scale, and there's a rubric where, where faculty can actually write uh, their opinions of the book. So that can be really helpful, um, especially since quality is context dependent. So a textbook that is you know, considered high quality and rigorous here at the University of Maryland uh, may not be appropriate for a, a community college uh, and vice versa. So just going back to this idea, if, if uh, we were to replace one traditional textbook with OER for, for each student, it would literally save over a billion dollars every year for students. The, the textbook 
U.S. higher ed textbook market is $8.8 .8 billion a year. If we just replace one textbook per student, it saves $1.42 billion uh, nationwide. So think about it there. Uh, as I said before, it's not about switching every class over to OER right away. It's about finding the places where faculty do want to make a change and supporting them to make that change. And as a, um, Quill West, a librarian uh, from out west in Washington State, uh, says, you start with the low-hanging fruit and remember all fruit falls eventually. Uh, speaking of that, <laughs> So the third thing is just to think about how you can provide support to faculty to uh, not only use, but actually adapt and create open educational resources. A couple of, of examples of how this is playing out. So the University of Massachusetts Amherst has a, a kind of pi help pioneer a model along with Temp Temple University uh, where they provide many grants to faculty uh, who, again, want to make a change in their courses and just need that like little extra piece of time or support to be able to do it. Uh, faculty apply for these grants, they're peer reviewed, uh, and then the liaison librarians at UMass Amherst actually work with the faculty to fully replace their traditional textbook with an open resource. And you know, the professors do everything from just simply adopting one of the OpenStax books off the shelf to writing their own resource and publishing that through the library. Uh, so again, starting with the low-hanging fruit, the people who want to make the change. Um, oh, and they've invested, uh, I think about a, uh, $50,000 in this program over the past few years, uh, maybe a little bit more, and save students over a million. Uh, libraries are also stepping into the, the publishing space. Uh, so Virginia Tech Libraries actually just worked with their business school to publish a intro business textbook. And uh, this is just a really exciting uh, space for libraries, as, as more libraries are, are thinking about uh, their role in publishing the uh, scholarly materials and uh, opportunities to partner across campus to help disseminate the, you know, the great wealth of knowledge that exists here. Uh, Spark runs, for those of you who are interested in, in learning more and connecting with other librarians, Spark runs a uh, online forum where you can connect uh, and, and uh, you know, send, send requests, like if you're looking for a resource in a specific area, you can send requests here um, to interact with, uh, I believe we have over 400 subscribers. So the final thing I just want to mention is about connecting openness to the mission of your institution. So I have uh, given talks at uh, hundreds of institutions over the past 10 years, and I have not found one yet where open does not connect to their mission. And just looking at, at the University of Maryland, um, you know, their, their open connects to all of this, excellence in teaching, research and service, uh, advancing knowledge uh, and um, importance to the state, nation, and world. So openness connects to all of this. It helps enhance education by helping students get access to the materials that they need. It helps serve your community by providing access to the wealth of information that exists here on campus. It helps support the world uh, by um, broadcasting the knowledge to parts of the world that would never get access to that kind of knowledge. And uh, Spark actually runs a program called OpenCon that's for students and early career researchers around the world. Uh, it's, uh, the main conference is going to happen in a couple of weeks here in Washington, or down in Washington, D.C. And we had over 10,000 people from across the world, uh, 175 countries apply to come. And one of the applicants was a student from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo who got interested in open education because he took a MOOC from the University of Maryland College Park. The professor was teaching a MOOC. He took it through the U.S. Embassy's MOOC Camps program, which provides on the ground um, engagement for students because MOOCs, um, you know, sometimes students don't persist with them, but when they have an online or an in-person mentor, they do. And because he got involved in that program and because the people here on campus were broadcasting what you were teaching, to the DRC, uh, you were able to activate this young activist who's going to be coming to the conference in November and hopefully go back to his country to inspire more young leaders to advance open education. 
So it truly can have an, a global impact, and if that doesn't fit into the mission of your institution, I don't know what does. So uh, I, I just want to close with that little anecdote because I think it's really cool. Um, and uh, I'd love to have a discussion with you uh, for whatever I, I'm told we have until 11.30-ish uh, for questions. Um, so, so yeah, I'd love to hear more from you. I can get it started. You had mentioned a, a within the context of textbook affordability, a five-year-old federal law. Mm -hmm. Could you just talk more about that and what impact that had? Yeah, sure. So the uh, the law was passed in 2008 as part of the Higher Education Act reauthorization um, at the end of the Bush, Bush administration. Uh, it uh, had uh, several components. One was requiring textbook publishers to disclose the prices of textbooks anytime they give information to professors. Another was requiring institutions to list the books in their course catalogs uh, when students are registering, which is something that, that didn't happen before. I, I mentioned it in the context of professors finding out about prices. So that law went into effect on July 1st, 2010, um, so a little bit over five years ago. Uh, and um, there's a GAO report in 2013 that looked at the implementation, and, and basically what it found is that publishers, yes, are disclosing prices, but they're doing it by providing a link to their website where the price exists. So it requires an extra step on behalf of faculty to get access to the price. So yes, prices are available, but they're not being directly presented to professors in a way that is you know, easily factored into their decision making. So, um, you know, from, from our perspective and, and the way that we've seen the problem continue to persist, it hasn't been uh, implemented the way that the, certainly the spirit of the law uh, was intended, perhaps the letter. I was involved in uh, advocating for that law in 2008, so that's why I know a little bit about it. Yeah, it seems like a big uh, victory just now. It was a huge victory, uh, but you know, as with any law, it's about the implementation. That's what matters. Thank you very much. I appreciated your uh, your talk today. One of the things I've heard in uh, from our um, our Senate faculty committee members and just faculty across campus when we bring up these issues is there is sometimes or often almost a, a knee jerk kind of reaction that these materi these OER materials are of, are of lower quality. And I just wondered, what are your thoughts on how to respond to, or talking points, mm -hmm. um, addressing the quality issue that some faculty seem to think exists? Yeah, thank you for that. And, and it's absolutely true that it is a knee-jerk reaction. Um, you get what you pay for, right? Uh, so this is one area where the research that's being done I, I find is very effective to point at studies that look at the use of open educational resources and find that students do as well or better. And I, I, I think that one of the challenges with quality is that, that we're used to looking for proxies of quality. Are the pages shiny? Are the images color? Uh, is the layout pretty? And all of those features have been associated with quality uh, in the past, but today uh, we actually have the ability to measure the efficacy of the actual material in terms of how students are learning. And at the end of the day, you know, that's what quality is. Are students learning? Are they succeeding in the course? And that's what matters, and that's what research can help point to. So, of course, research isn't going to point to the specific efficacy of an individual material and an individual context because, again, quality is context dependent. What's, what's quality in one place isn't in another. So, I, I think it's helping, part of it is helping to just challenge the, I guess, perceptions of quality that have always existed and pointing to the research base that shows that open materials can be more effective. Um, you know, especially when you, you, you point out things like you have control over the resource that you're using in your classroom as opposed to, uh, you know, being essentially locked into whatever the publisher has decided to put into the book. 
you know, there are lots of ways to actually increase the quality of the resource that you're using. Not my precious coffee. So um, thank you, you know, as everybody I think is probably going to say for that talk is really informative. I think um, sort of piggybacking on that question of quality um, is, to me, whenever I've had conversations with faculty, and full disclosure, I actually used to be a textbook publisher or work for a textbook publishing company in that little 10% little slice um, <laughs> that was not Schmierson. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> Anyways, like um, when we would have those conversations about it, you know, it was really difficult to kind of get around this, this sort of question of like a foundational reading, right? It's hard to teach business without HBP cases, you know? It's hard to teach English without that Norton anthology. And I was wondering how or if OERs can kind of be used in that context without starting to kind of push, you know, curriculum changes almost. So, Maybe I'm not going to answer your question correctly, and if so, correct me. Um, so I, I think what you're asking about is uh, the kind of canonical texts yeah. that exist and how curriculums have always evolved around those texts mm -hmm. uh, and whether that's going to start changing things. Um, so I, I think first let's just recognize that education isn't one size fits all and each instructor is going to put their own spin on a subject and regardless, and we know this from K-12 education, regardless of what the standards say or what the textbook says, students are going to learn different things in different classes because each teacher brings a, a, a different spin on the content. So I, I think that's, that's already happening um, and relying on the textbook as the uniting feature has not proven to be the way to make sure that everybody is on the same page, especially when less than half of the people in any given course are, are going to have the current version of the textbook that they've been assigned. Um, so I, I think that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is that there is not, there's no knowledge in Norton's anthology that cannot be re reproduced in an OER. There are expressions of knowledge that cannot be legally copied. But there is no knowledge in there that isn't well established that can't be re reproduced in the form of OER. So that's what we're seeing happening with the OpenStax books in intro subjects. Uh, you know, I, I, I um, don't want to speak for professors, but I highly doubt that most of the professors that are using that economics textbook are doing it because OpenStax has found a revolutionary way to teach economics. They're using it because they have represented the knowledge that constitutes in intro economics in a book that students can actually afford to access and have. So I don't see open educational resources changing curriculum in that sense because it's about the knowledge, not about the representation of the knowledge. Uh, but what I do think it does is open up opportunities for professors to teach more effectively and tailor the content to the way that they want to teach. And that's why we have academic freedom. It's because professors bring knowledge. The reason that we have universities is that you know, the professors are experts in their subjects and should be able to teach the way that they see fit. So I, I think OER just expands what's possible uh, in, in terms of teaching. Did that get it? Uh, yeah, you talked about the open learning initiative, which yeah. it's a little bit more, um, I guess, interactive. And so I guess I'm wondering um, if there's more of a market or you see more of a demand for increased functionality or more interactivity mm -hmm. in, in a way are. Oh, totally. And thank you for bringing that up. I mean, that's, that's the future of course materials. You know, there, there are a certain set of professors that are always going to use the, you know, thousand page printed textbook, but increasingly, uh, you know, more professors are comfortable teaching online, want to use digital resources, more students are comfortable using digital resources, and that enables us to go in, in new directions. And textbook publishers recognize that and uh, are offering um, digital supplements that go with textbooks from interactive online homework to online portals with, with digital supplements. So we're already starting to see that work its way into classrooms. And that this actually is an area where um, 
the OER movement in, just in terms of strategy and thinking about how we can continue to remain relevant into the future, um, you know, beyond just providing core content, but actually provide low or high quality, low cost uh, um, resources built around that. Uh, so this idea of having adaptive software that goes with it. And OpenStax, again, has been a pioneer in this area. They offer um, something called OpenStax Tutor, which is a software that goes with their books and does the kind of things I was mentioning with the, the Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative where um, you know, it can predict kind of how you're learning and um, uh, help suggest things that will help you learn better drawing, not just from that particular textbook, but drawing in knowledge from outside of it as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I think learning is evolving in that direction. And the more open we can make it, the better, because otherwise we're just going to be re repeating the whole problem all over again. Um, I was curious to see the prices for the ebook rentals, mm -hmm. um, especially considering the course decision in the Redigi case in 2013 that found that um, transfer of electronic resources from one medium to another did not constitute a uh, right of first sale, or it violated the terms of right of first sale. And I'm curious as to, considering that that case was found in favor of the publishers, it seems that they're becoming even more restrictive with electronic resources, even though they are already afforded additional protections. And I'm curious as to why that is, and if you're noticing any trends towards um, more restrictiveness with e-resources from these, from the five publishers that make up 90% of the market. Super interesting question, thank you. Uh, so, first, ask the record labels how effective copyright was, and copyright protection was in controlling the proliferation of, of music that they held the rights to. Uh, so publishers know that they can't rely, so if their plan is to continue to make money by limiting access to intellectual property and selling access to intellectual property, um, they know that relying solely upon copyright protections is insufficient. Uh, because, you know, this stuff is online and students can find it. Um, so. They're absolutely doing that. So DRM is uh, part of every ebook. Uh, this idea of selling access codes to ebooks and having them expire is a key part of that because they can control how much, how how long the book is on the market, and they can control how many students get access to it. So, for example, these login codes um, to get access to the ebook version I showed, uh, you can only log in from one location at at, at a time. So you can't be logged in on like your smartphone and your computer. If you're logged in at home it, and you sign in at school, it'll log you out. So they're finding ways to just make sure that they have control over the copies of the resources in order to continue their business model of charging each student for access. That said, they're also thinking bigger. And I've seen a number of institutions uh, go the direction of, for example, a subscription or all-you-can-eat access to publisher catalogs. Uh, and there have been a couple of pilots of this uh, that have had mixed results. So I think generally students like it when they get the resource for free uh, in their class. So you can't trust most of the results because students aren't actually buying the books the way they would normally with an ebook. They're just giving it for free. Um, but because these books are uh, often, you know, difficult to access or, um, you know, not really interactive, they're just sort of a PDF, uh, students aren't excited about them. Uh, so, you know, we'll see how this evolves. I think if you hear conversations on this campus about going to an all-inclusive model where students pay one flat fee per semester uh, for all of their books or where they pay a direct build course fee, to get access to the textbook, be very wary. And I, I, I don't think, you know, I, I need to tell you as librarians the challenges with ebook subscriptions and limited licenses and, you know, the certain number of seats that get access to resources, you know, those that's challenging. And 
especially when it comes to educational resources that students should have access to for the rest of their lives. Um, that's dangerous to move to that kind of a model when we can move to a kind of model where, where the resources are open. So thanks for bringing that up. Did that address what you were looking for? Okay. Uh, so, um, so there are some commercial entities that are trying to enter this, um, uh, the open educational resources market, and you know we've, we get, get approached by these, these entities all the time, and I guess their basic model is they will come in and work with faculty, they will help faculty put together open materials for their course, and then they pass along a, a much reduced cost to mm -hmm. the students. So I think one thing we're, we're you know, thinking about, or I wouldn't say struggling, but just kind of evaluating is um, as a library, as a university, should we continue to push for the strictly open educational resources approach or um, would it be better in the short term to perhaps work with a commercial um, or are we, feeding, are we just feeding into the system again? I think, um, so any thoughts on that, whether you have any experience with other institutions who are yeah. engaging with a commercial entity to help with this effort? So let me just, point of clarification, uh, when you're talking about commercial entities, you're talking about entities that come in and work with faculty to adopt OER that remains OER? Yes, exactly. Okay. And then they, may, they, they get their profits by yeah. charging students a much reduced rate for whatever materials they use in the class. Yeah, great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so OER is free, but it isn't free. So I think that's an important thing to acknowledge. It's free like a puppy. So <laughs> you can use it, but in order to really properly implement it, there are costs to that. You know, it takes professors time if they want to modify the resource and, and deploy it in their course. It takes, you know, it, 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 instructional design help. It takes technological help. Um, it takes, you know, different software and expertise and, you know, if you want to do assessments, researcher time. Uh, so there's lots of things around OER that do cost money and there's nothing wrong with passing that cost along to the student if it's reasonable. The question I think it needs to come down to are students paying for value? With buying a $400, $400 economics textbook, students aren't paying for value. But if you're asking them to pay for a reasonable course fee so that a commercial company can come in and give faculty the support they need to start using an open educational resource that's you know, otherwise free to the students to keep and use forever um, and free to the rest of the world, I think that's reasonable. And uh, I'd also mention that I think it's really important to involve students in that decision making, uh, especially if it's a campus-wide decision. Uh, students are their best advocates <laughs> um, and are often surprisingly left out of important conversations <coughs> like this. So I, I think it's really up to your student body whether that's something that they see the value in. And, and, and I think in most cases, students would much rather pay a small fee to get access to materials that they can use and keep forever and that are easy to access and continue to get better over time uh, as opposed to paying a lot or maybe not paying for a resource that's really expensive. So just one company that, that we've worked with a lot and, and uh, uh, generally support is Lumen Learning. Um, they may, may be one. I think they're mostly focused on, on two-year colleges, uh, but they function as kind of a social enterprise, so they're not you know, making a ton of money. Their mission is to help people use OER. Okay, so I want to mention one more thing that I didn't mention. Um, so just tenure and promotion. Uh, that's something that is kind of the um, be-all end-all of change in the academy. If you can change the tenure and promotion process, you can change the academy. Obviously, it changes very slowly. Uh, just a couple of things I want to mention. Um, so if there are ways to incorporate not a requirement to use OER, but recognition of OER into the tenure and promotion process, you know, whether it's just a checkbox on the form that says, you know, I've used OER in my teaching, or is it possible to put it in the teacher evaluations that students fill out? Um, uh, you know, things that, can you give awards to faculty who are using open educational resources? I saw the faculty profiles on oer.umd.edu, which is great. Are there ways to turn that into something that can be um, added to a CV or, or tenure and promotion application. So just, you know, food for thought. 
throwing that idea out there. I'm sensing from the room that we're nearing completion. Well, thank you very much, Nicole. Please uh, join me in thanking.